There we go. All right, cool. All right, man. So, guys, uh, so happy to bring John on board to meet with you guys and just tell you guys his story. I've followed John for quite a while, and in the world of, I think, hand lettering and stuff, I don't think technically there's anyone really doing it as kind of innovative and cool as John's doing. So um, I know you've all seen his work. He's going to share some as he's kind of going through his story and everything. But um, I, I really just love bringing in these people that can kind of inspire you guys to think a little differently. Some of you love hand lettering. Some of you probably don't do it as much as you want to. But hopefully John can give you guys a little bit of inspiration and more about his story and the things that you have to do beyond just the design part and the creativity part, but the struggle of uh, work, the struggle of starting your own business, the struggle of keeping it alive. Um, so we talked a little bit about that, and he's going to have a ton of information there on, uh, in his presentation. So it's all yours, man. All right, well, guys, um, I just want to prep you first and say that what I'd like to do is I'm going to go through a whole bunch of shit like <laughs> a long, long, long time ago because I think the most important part of being a designer is more about the trials and tribulations, the business aspect of things, not so much about the actual design work because I feel like every one of us can do what I'm about to show you. I'm not going to show you anything that you guys can't handle um, because I'm just, in reality, I'm not that talented. I'm not a Michael I'm not, I'm, I'm not one of those people and I'm never going to be one of those people. But what I am is someone that really wanted to do something really badly and worked really hard and kept trying and kept pushing myself. And I started from a very young age. So what I'm going to do is I'll walk you guys through kind of like the beginning of everything and explain to you kind of how I started to develop my business and how I got to where I am. And hopefully I don't run on too long uh, because this is a very, very long story and I'll try to keep this as kind of possible. <laughs> All right, cool. So let me see if I can share screen first. You want to hit, I think, the blue uh, plus button? Is that what it is? Let me see. Yeah. The, oh, uh -huh. Hover over and then hit that blue plus, and then you should get the option of share screen. Look at this. Okay. All right. I think I should. Okay. I, I'm going to have to share the entire screen, I think. Okay. Are you guys seeing my screen? Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So that's me. There we go. That's a self portrait. <laughs> 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 um, I feel like rats get a bit rap all the time, but especially being from New York, I, 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 don't, I don't hate rats. I feel like all they're trying to, they're just trying to live, you know? They're just trying to live. And maybe, and maybe they, don't have, uh, they don't have all the luxuries that every other thing in the city has. I mean, at least pigeons can fly away. But uh, rats might get run over by trains and hit by trucks and kicked around the street and everything. And I always felt that uh, it was kind of an underrated um, underrated, underrated aspect of the city, so um, <laughs> I like to represent myself like that, uh, and without all the negative aspects, of course. So, what I want to go through is a little, is a little um, story I put together called Escaping Hell, and hell being kind of like, it starts in various stages, and there's, there's only different levels, and you know, as a, as a, as a young designer, um, I really, I started, I started drawing when I was a kid, when I was a really, really little kid, as soon as I could pick up a pencil, um, I was drawing logos and letters and all sorts of stuff, it definitely uh, was something I was interested in a long time ago. Um, so I, I started developing it, and I really got into art, and my mother's an artist, and my grandmother was an artist, and we have all sorts of creative people in my family, so it definitely flourished as a child, so I, I definitely pushed it. Um, by the time was a, a, a young teenager. I had started playing in um, hardcore and, and death metal bands. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was really into aggressive music and stuff like that. And, and luckily for me, being from New York, there was a scene for that. Um, so as a young, young kid, I really got into music. And as soon as I got into music, I started to realize there was a, a use for, for what I do. Um, and that, and that kind of like helped me flourish into somewhat of a designer. Right? And, and as that happened, I started to find ways um, to design things. So we'll start off with the first thing. So as a kid, you can do cool stuff, but your reality you actually sucks. So this is where <laughs> you are a young kid, maybe between the ages of 10 and 13, 
um, you are doing, you know, whatever, drawing on the back of notebooks, you, you're, you, who knows what you're doing, but you put stuff and you don't realize that there's anything besides what you're doing. There's not, there's not good and there's not shitty, there's just what it is and that's it. But in actuality, looking back on it, you're not that, and as you can see here, was not that great. <laughs> what, what we have here, um, and this is kind of where I started. I, these things were done um, between the ages of 12 and 14. Um, so I had picked up a copy of Photoshop 2, I think, from a friend of mine. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, illegally, of course. <laughs> and I just started going at it. I just spent every waking moment just, like, messing with it, designing it, teaching myself HTML, like, all this type of stuff. And by the time I was about 13 or 14, and you'll see on the top left, that nice little Internet Explorer page there, <laughs> that, was my, that was my second paying job. My first paying job was a, a little local design I did for someone for um, like a newspaper. It paid me like 50 bucks. I was 12 years old, and it was like the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> but that right there was my very first job. Um, and that was a website I did for physical therapy. Uh, well, it's in my neighborhood, and I got paid 400 bucks. <laughs> um, it was it was kind of eye-opening in terms of what the hell I could possibly be doing in my life. And I was only 14. So, you know, although it's disgusting and terrible, it was kind of an eye-opening event for me where it was just like, I can I can make stuff, people will pay me for it. So you can kind of see, like, this is, this is the kind of stuff I was doing in my... You know, 13, 14, 15 year old self. Um, <laughs> here's some more stuff. I started getting into more band stuff. And, and on the right side, I don't know how old everybody is, but on the right side, that's, that's Winamp. That was a thing that we used, used to play MP3s on. Oh, <laughs> yeah. uh, so anything that I could customize, I would do. And anything that I was able to get my hands on, I would do. So if it was like, yeah, I did a lot of stuff for it these like really, really small independent record labels. I did a, a bunch of these like CD and demo covers. Anything I could customize, I got my hands on. A lot of stuff I did for free. Every now and again, I'd get towards 50 bucks, 100 bucks. But in, in my early to mid teens, this is how I spent a lot of my time. And this is really what I got into. So, you know, kind of like learning what it was like to be a designer, learning what it was like to make mistakes and do really terrible shit and, and learn from it. But also learn how to actually get paid for the stuff. Like, like just saying, like, uh, you know, someone's, someone said to me, you know, we need a, you know, a CD layout for this new CD we're putting out, whatever. I would be like, cool, I can do it for 100 bucks. Awesome. They'd give me 100 bucks, I would design it, everything is great. But then there was also a lot of times where it was like, I'll do it for 100 bucks, cool. I do it. Hey, you guys, I'm done. You know, can you hook me up with 100 bucks? Oh, yeah, 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 we'll get to it. Like, our drummer doesn't have the money right now. We got to all chip in. Okay. Three months later, four months later, ten months later. You know, you, there's a lot to learn about getting paid and not getting paid on top of it. And that's what a lot of this stuff was, was an introduction to doing stuff and and seeing it come to life and it being used on, on products and things. And then, you know, maybe getting paid and maybe not getting paid and having to, to deal with the repercussions of that. So the next step, it's, it's kind of like when things start to get good, and you don't have any responsibilities. You're just like, I, you know, I'm the king of everything. I, I know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm making money. Like I don't have to, I'm, I'm set. Um, and and what you have here, these were these. This is when I really started kicking the gear. These were record layouts that I did um, the end, towards the end of high school, the beginning of college. And these are for um, you know larger bands on indie labels. And I ended up doing a bunch of these, and it was great. I was working. I was basically a part-time freelancer um, through the last part of high school and of college. And I really started to know what I was doing at this point. So it wasn't so much about um, just being, you know, a kid messing around and getting a couple bucks here and there and making it, you know, seem cool when things would get printed on t-shirts. But it was about actually being good at something and having a decent knowledge base of what I was doing because at this point, I'm like four, five, six years deep in actual legitimate experience. So um, it, it was pretty amazing to be able to get to this point. The downside to all of this is that you don't realize that this is not what the world is. Like when I was designing CD and record layout, it was also 
before we had, you know, any kind of streaming music services. It was before people were even purchasing MP3s through like iTunes or anything. So I, I was I was in my late teens, early twenty, thinking I'm going into the record industry. I'm going to find CD packaging. That's that's what I want to do. That's where I want to be. And unfortunately, that kind of disappeared pretty quickly. Um, so you can see, like, I got involved with a lot of bands that ended up, you know, being pretty decently sized on, on pretty big labels. Uh, the Black Dahlia Murder being one of them, which ended up being signed to uh, the biggest metal label in existence. Um, and I had followed, I had followed them through their demo into, into you know, various record and website designs and stuff. So I had really started picking up a legitimate client base, but it just, it, it was doomed. It was never going to last. And it was a shame. So I kind of had to switch gears a little bit and, you know, see what I could do about, you know, continuing to make this my life. So it <laughs> gets to the next level and, and everyone you deal with is stupid. So once you get out of the dream world of like, I'm doing cool stuff, cool people, it doesn't, it just, you realize that it all doesn't work like it. And it's a shame that it doesn't work like that either. Because that's, I, you know, that's, <laughs> that's why we do this is because we all want to do cool stuff. We want to do it for cool people and we want to make money doing it. But unfortunately, it doesn't it doesn't really work that way because as soon as you have to rely on yourself for bills and this and that and the other thing, insurance or whatever, whatever you have to start paying for out of pocket, that's when that's when the garbage parts start coming out. So when I graduated in college, um, I was pretty set on freelance and full time. I had a great set of. Uh, record label and band clients. I was doing a lot of cool, fun stuff. Um, and I was ready to go. But as soon as I graduated in college and it was like, okay, time to do this full time, number one, um, I realized that those clients were not enough to kind of really supplement what I was doing as, as a designer or as a person in you know my early 20s. And number two, I realized that I didn't have the discipline to actually create a business for myself to work you know, 40 plus hours a week, I, I would sit down and I really didn't know what to do with myself. Unless something was coming to me, I didn't know how to drum up business, I didn't know how to do any of that stuff. So, after a couple of months of sitting around and um, trying to put some things together, and it, it, there was there was a lot of me kind of sitting there, you know, you know, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? Oh, I know, maybe I'll just take a break, I'll watch a movie real quick and recharge. So I watched a lot of movies those, those first couple of months. <laughs> Every time I sat down to be charged, I was like, I, you know, I don't really have anything in the tank. Let me, let me just watch another movie. Let me just like cleanse my palate a little bit. So I just kept doing that, and I just ended up not doing anything. So after about two months, I, you know, I was like, maybe I should just go get a job somewhere. So I did, um, and it was awful. And what I ended up doing was, uh, I was, this is, this is, it, it's one of those, it's one of those things where it's just like. They try to prop you up as high as you can be without actually paying you that. So, so when they hired me, that I was the assistant to the creative director. So like not the assistant creative director, the assistant to the creative director. <laughs> so that was just enough to pay me like at least like ten thousand dollars less per year. <laughs> uh, and what ended up happening was this company only did work for financial advisors, and those are the most dull, boring, like. <laughs> Miserable people that you could possibly work for, <laughs> and you know every once every once in a while maybe like I get an architect thrown my way, but for the most part it was pretty mis miserable stuff. So I did a lot of these ads, I did a lot of these websites, business cards with paragraphs on them, <laughs> and like it was impossible to explain to people that you can only print words so small before they become illegible, and it, it was it was just a lot of issues and. Everything was exactly the same. I mean, like, it, like you wouldn't look at that and be like, "Oh, that's John Contino right there." <laughs> this is just—it's it, just—it's insane, you know, how terrible some of this stuff really ends up being, you know. So, so what had happened with this place is that I, I worked there for—I don't know—it was maybe a month and a half. It was about a month and a half, and a friend of mine. Uh, worked at, at this other kind of small design print shop. And he was just like, you know, I, I think there might be a spot opening. He goes, I'll, I'll let you know, though. I I, don't, don't hold me to it. So I was like, oh, that might be cool to work with my friend, whatever. Um, so 
in that time, I had been sitting with some of my employees at this place and trying to make friends. But, you know, when you, when you work with some people that are kind of like the nine to five versus the, the people like us that kind of eat, sleep, breathe, design work, and, and just all the stuff that we're so obsessed with, it's a different world. And you don't really see eye to eye in a lot of things. So I was, we were friendly with each other, but we definitely seemed to come from different worlds. And the, the thing that really put it over the edge was I, was I was sitting there while they were all discussing the Christmas party that was about to come up and the Christmas party they had last year. And they were just talking about how the owners uh, rented a party bus into like Times Square and <laughs> they, they like brought like a joint on and everybody smoked a little weed and it was so crazy. And I was like, I can't, I can't be part of this. <laughs> it's just not, this is not something for me, I can't. <laughs> So luckily, my friend kind of got in touch, and he was like, yeah, we got an opening. Do you want to come for an interview? And I was like, yeah, goddamn right, I do. <laughs> so I stuck at work, went for an interview. It was great. Everybody was cool. You know, they were like blasted metal, young know, yelling at each other, all sorts of fun stuff that I love. And uh, I was like, I, what do I have to do to work here? Like, I was willing to take a, like a 90% pay cut to work at that place. Um, luckily, they were able to give me a little bit more, so it at least made me feel like I was worth something, so that was a good sign. Um, you know, but it, 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 didn't, it didn't really come with like the perks that I, that I was hoping for, because um, things got a little bit better, but they weren't great. You know, I, I was still kind of doing a lot of the stuff that was happening before, except it was for just slightly less dull clients. They were just as annoying. They just weren't as dull. So like I got to do a lot of really uh, obnoxious club t-shirts and you know websites for uh, <laughs> uh, photographers. This one's like a, what do you call it? Uh, paparazzi photo website. And it was you know like some of the stuff that would come around was just like oh it's kind of kind of ridiculous. But the good thing was is that the guys that were working there were like really talented people and I learned a ton from them in the course of maybe eight months. And the guy who owned the company was just, he was just an absolute maniac. And he's, he's a good friend of mine now, but at the time, he was just, we used to call it designer boot camp because we would go in there and we would have to knock out like crazy amounts of designs, high quality, and we would never get a, yeah, that's great, love it, that's good. It would just be like, are we done yet, kind of thing. And if we weren't, it would just, you know, be very high-intensity situation. So in this place, I learned how to work good really fast. And I thought I was fast before then. Uh, but when I got in here, there were people just blown away getting stuff done faster than I'd ever seen. So I really learned how to pick up the pace and, and how to make decisions on editing stuff. Like, how do you, you know, one, one thing that happens as a designer is that you'll do a hundred different mock-ups or something, and you can't, okay, it's like time to narrow it down. Okay, I narrowed it down to 80. Well, you have to narrow it down to three, so keep going, you know? And so in this process, I really learned how to self-edit as I'm working, to, and that saved a bunch of time. So if you're able to kind of like understand your process and learn a little bit more about how things go, um, you can start making cuts before you finish it, and that saves a ton. So I, I did learn a lot from that, but but when I got to that point of kind of like figuring out exactly you know who I was and, and, and where I belonged, it, it started to kind of like hang on a little bit. So that got me to the point where I didn't really know what I was supposed to be doing with myself. You know, and, and towards the end of the uh, time of working there, I, I did some stuff that, that started feeling a little bit better. You know, I was doing a lot of web stuff because it was the place I got to really flex my design muscles as much as I could at that point. And it was, um, it, it was just a way to kind of like get a little bit more satisfaction at what I was doing. But, you know, I, I knew I was getting better. I knew I could pump out good work quicker. I knew I had the ability to do this on my own, so that's exactly what I did. So around 2005, uh, no, I'm sorry, 2006, summer 2006, I decided that was it. I'm gonna, I, I have what it takes to go out on my own. I had been freelancing that whole time, and and the, the owner of that company and myself made this deal. I was gonna go out on my own, start my own studio, and he was gonna subcontract stuff to me. So this way, 
I could still keep a lot of the work that I was doing, but I could also do my own work and I could kind of charge things um, more along the lines of what I wanted. And he liked it because he didn't have to pay me a salary or what. So it was kind of the best of both worlds. So the problem is, is that, yeah, I'm, I'm in control now, but <laughs> at what cost it, it, is this control coming to? So this is, this is kind of what I ended up with. I ended up doing a lot of <laughs> Uh, I did a lot of custom MySpace pages, which believe it or not is like a plus of income at that point. <laughs> and it was just, it was a lot of, it was, it was just a lot of this. The, the, the thing that made it feel better though was that I was working in my own space on my own time without having anyone looking over my shoulder. So although I had the, the wonderful bow wow to work with. <laughs> There's no one really giving me a hard time, so you know it was still it was still great. I got to listen to my own music, and go to lunch when I want, and leave when I want. And it was all right, but you know a lot of this type of stuff followed. You know there was a, like like on the top right, for example, I didn't even design that. Someone gave that to me and paid me to cut it up in HTML, program it, and it was like you know I got to pay bills, so I'll do it. And you do it. There was a lot of stuff like that where we had to do it. Now if you look at the bottom left, you can kind of see where my sensibilities starting are starting to kind of come through. And that was, um, I want to say, it took maybe about a year to get to that point where, where people would let me be myself a little bit more. So around 2007 or so, I really started to um, try to get, I really started to get more of my stuff out there to other clients. And they were allowing me to take it a little further. So you'd see a lot more custom lettering and stuff. Now, also, if you've seen my work today versus this, you know, this kind of old English stuff, you can see how much has advanced since then. I, there's a lot of rules that I just did not follow and this old stuff that I've learned as time has gone. Um, but it was a good place to start. So once I really started to kick into gear, um, it, it, it felt like the good stuff, it, 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 it was coming in, but I didn't know how to keep it. You know, and this was a lot. This is when more illustration stuff started coming in. Um, this is when bigger jobs started coming in. There was a lot of interesting work that finally started to work their way in, and I think this stuff looks a little bit more like what I do today. Maybe it's a little bit more immature um, based on what I do, but you can see how it finally started turning into something. Um, so, in, in particular, the the top. So the top left. The top left one was the, the job that really broke everything through for me. And that was um, Coca-Cola was developing a new soft drink. And an ad agency in Paris, well, it's an international ad agency, hopefully, um, they contacted me. They asked me if I'd be interested in doing some lettering for some ads. I said, great, I'd love to. <clears throat> and then we eventually turned all this lettering into a custom font. And it was a huge job. It took maybe a year and a half, almost two years to complete. And I got to charge a decent amount of money for it. Now, I didn't know how much to charge. I didn't know what was decent. And if I were to quote this today, I would laugh at the number that I actually got paid for it. But it was, it was definitely um, an eye-opening event for me. And it was great. The top right one was Pop-Tarts ad. The bottom left was sketches for a Nike event. And all this stuff started happening. So I was just like, okay. There's something here. I can finally start. I can finally start turning it into something. So, at this point in time, I started to develop um, kind of a voice for myself. I did a lot more illustration work. I started to, you know, um, beef up my portfolio with this more interesting stuff, and less of the stuff that you guys just saw. Now, what happened was around this time is when the uh, recession hit. So we're thinking like 2008 or so. And when the recession hit, I had two main clients that were uh, that had me on retainer. So I could do all the cool stuff I wanted for as little or as much as I could quote for, but the retainer kept me going. So with those with that retainer, I would get paid X amount of thousands of dollars per month to basically do whatever they needed me to do. Sometimes they didn't need anything. Sometimes they needed a lot of stuff. But whatever it was, I was always getting paid. And that kept the lights on. That kept me stress free. I would go home. It was great. I was getting engaged. Like we, you know, my my now wife and I were, you know, I would get home by six o'clock at night, go out to dinner, hang out, every, very stress free. 
when the recession hit, those two companies closed the doors. <laughs> and we stuck with nothing of any significance to kind of like keep the lights on. So what we were doing at that point, I had a business partner too. Um, we took all the designs that we had that got rejected from other clients and we turned them into another business. And that other business is called CXXVI. And that was a menswear line. Now, it didn't, it didn't turn out, it didn't intend to be a menswear line, but that's what, that's what happened. We took a couple of t-shirts, we threw them online, we got them on a couple of blogs, and we started to see some orders coming through. So we were like, this is great, fantastic. And as the orders were coming through, we were also getting emails. When's the next season coming out? What you guys, are you guys doing? Cotton so are you guys going to be doing hats and this and accessories, whatever. So it was something we never, ever thought about. But at this point, life kind of threw us a curveball and went with it. We turned the design studio into a full-time clothing company. And this clothing company gave the outlet to kind of do all the stuff I always wanted to do, but never had the opportunity to do. I got to art direct my own products and turn it into something. So with, with that, you know, even like the only person who was going to reject work was me. So if I didn't like it, it wasn't staying. If I liked it, it was staying. And whether people bought it or not, I didn't really care because I was getting it out. So I just kept, I, I learned so much about myself as an artist at this point, and I learned so much about how I could push barriers and how I could take the things I've been trying to sell to people for two, three, four, five years and turn it into something. Because, this, because if, you give, if you give a client something, you say, listen, this is going to be awesome. And they say, you know, it sounds a little too risky. But we don't want to do it. You don't get to do it, but if you create something on your own and you execute and you show them how cool it can be, then all of a sudden everyone comes running. Oh yeah, why didn't we tell you you could do this? Why didn't we tell you to do that? Like they <laughs> have to see it for themselves in order to understand it because they can't just go on your word. Yeah. So part of the clothing company was me basically showing what I was capable of doing. Um, so you know whether it was t-shirts or signage or um, illustration work, whatever it was, there was so much that I could put out there and turn into things. I, you know, it even got into how do you design the packets? How do you, like, what kind of special event products can you do? It was all these types of things. Like, I did these engraved Zippo lighters years and years ago when we were doing a trade show. And the trade show asked me if I could do something live um, right there while everybody was walking through. And it was a huge hit. Like, who knew, you know? Um, so it was just a, it was just another thing that I was able to learn about myself and and where I could take where I could take my business. So so here's kind of where things take a turn. It's your, in over the course of a few years, we're, we're we're starting to build the company. The company's getting bigger. It's getting better. Um, and we were getting approached with bigger orders from bigger bigger stores. One store came through. And ordered, um, I forget how much, maybe $160,000, $180,000 worth of goods, which was about two seasons for us. And what we needed to do was hook up with a, with a factoring company, which is basically um, a financing company. What they do is they go in, they check the company that buying the goods, they check their credit, it falls good, they pay you to develop it. Then when, it's, when the product is delivered, they pay you and then take a cut. So if it's like, Hundred thousand dollars, they'll take twenty percent, and you get eighty thousand dollars. But that twenty percent that they're taking is the twenty percent that you'll risk. You know, like you'll be like, take twenty percent. I just want to get paid. Um, so it was a good kind of relationship. Except when this, when we started working with this company, they secretly <laughs> declared bankruptcy um, without anyone knowing, and we were about a week away from getting paid, and we ended up. Losing, I think it was about $120,000 from the company, and it completely, completely killed our company. Um, so we had to we had to figure out a way to dig out of $120,000 of debt, um, which is really hard to do if you don't have any money to keep making more product. So it really kind of hurt the business. Now at this point, luckily for me, I had a foresight, and I felt like. Sooner or later, something like this was going to happen. So what I did was take all the stuff I had been doing with CXXVR, and I made a separate freelancing website for myself, just under my name, just John Constantinelli. It was a studio, 
It was nothing. It was just it was just me. And I just put it all up. I wasn't expecting anything, but I figured if I needed to start making extra money, I could, and it could be kind of more along the lines of the type of stuff I wanted to do. Um, so luckily for me, um, that actually started picking up pretty decently. And simultaneously with the clothing company, I was basically working two jobs. I had I had my freelancing business and I had clothing business. So by the time the clothing business got into that really bad legal trouble, I had enough work on the other end to keep keeping me afloat and to keep my wife and I afloat. We, didn't, we never missed rent and we could always buy dinner. It wasn't, it wasn't the end of the world. But it kind of it kind of helped me survive a little bit. It took maybe a, uh, man, that happened in 2011, and I think we finally got it resolved as of last summer. So it took about four and a half years to resolve that legal matter and about $80,000. And uh, unfortunately, it was like the most expensive lesson I ever had to learn about um, creating a uh, creative business and the, the financial problems that could come with. So once we had finally finished paying all that stuff back and everything, I kind of kind of wiped my hands on the whole thing. And I say I, I had been freelance. I started the freelancing thing about 2010. So <clears throat> within a few years, I went from the freelancing to a studio. And in the studio, um, I started getting to do cool stuff. Again. And Nike came back to me. Nike became a huge client for me. And I started doing lots of really cool stuff at Nike. Um, this was a, a racing event um, that they held in the Bronx. And it was just... I got to do all the signage, I got to do the t-shirts, and the, I mean, you can see this, this lettering and logos and illustrations, you know, everything. I mean, it's, they covered a whole entire bus with it. Um, so, as I started to develop these relationships, like, another one, and there was a, a huge event that we, it was a worldwide running event that we did for Nike, too. I, I got to develop a font, I got to develop all these cool illustrations, the signage, all this great stuff, and it, you know, it, it really started to, it really became this, like this, this juggernaut of a, of a thing where I was picking up all these bigger clients and doing a lot of stuff. And, and at that point, it was really a full-fledged design studio. I had picked up a couple, I had two business managers, I had a couple of subcontractors that would do some bigger stuff with me. And to this day, I'm still operating as a, you know, a small design studio, but we have a few people here who are handling a lot of stuff. And we get to do a lot of cool things, too. Another thing I got to do was um, the branding for The Book of Life, which was a movie uh, by 20th Century Fox that came out about a year and a half ago. And it was great stuff. I mean, I worked directly with the art director from 20th Century Fox. He and I became, became friends. And it was just like, let's see how much cool stuff we can crank out. It, it was a very... Um, interesting project too because normally with a project of, of that magnitude you're going to get a lot of people breathing down your neck a lot of legal, you can't do this you can't do that, blah 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 but this guy was like, whatever you can come up with let's do it, and he's like, can you put some more skulls in there? I was like, god damn right, put some more skulls in there <laughs> so we got to do a lot of stuff like that it, it's, you know, kind of I got to immerse myself in the, the, the history of the day of the dead I got to, you know I, there was so many sketches, there so many different styles I got to work. It was really, it was a really fun project. Excuse me. So, as I as I did more stuff like this, branding became a much bigger thing for me too. And it was, it's so funny. I think the thing I'm probably most known for at this point is branding and T-shirt design. And maybe where I'm at, that doesn't seem maybe ten or twelve years ago. I would cite those as my weakest points. Like, I suck at designing logos. I suck at designing t-shirts. I hope I never have to do another one again. That's pretty much all I do at this point. So, uh, about a year and a half ago, too, I also worked on the branding for the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. Um, again, this is this this is where I came from, like those really terrible, terrible projects I showed you guys before. To now, I'm doing these ridiculous, ridiculous jobs, and I'm loving every second of it. I'm, I'm getting I'm getting the ability to do what I want with it too. Like these, these clients are coming to me saying we want, you know, the John Contino treatment, and this is all. I, I would say I can I can thank the recession for this. I can thank failure. I can thank that company going out of business for all this stuff. Because if I, the only thing I had in those points um, 
where my back was against the wall was my love and my passion for design. And I, I knew that there was never going to be a time where I could just quit and go do something else. Like, this is always in me, and it's always something I needed to do. So I'm going to have to just find a way to make it happen. And, it, and, and with my back against the wall and trying to find a way, I ended up becoming more and more honest with myself. Like, okay, I have, we have an $80,000 bill, legal bill that we got to take care of. Like, it's not going to get worse than this, you know? Like, unless, you know, knock on wood, somebody dies or the house burns down, it's not going to get worse than this. So let's just, you know, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it on my own terms. And I just, I keep telling myself that. I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. I'm not going to be forced into something I don't want to do. And I found a way to make that happen. And, and thankfully, because of that, I get to do stuff like this now. You know, it's the, the entire brand, this whole thing. I mean, it's, it, at one point, we even talked about designing Sports Illustrated Manhead for the magazine, but that, that kind of got shut down by Lee. Everything else was good to go. I mean, we got to do a ton of stuff for this, and it was incredible. You know, it got to the point where it was so, it was, it was such a, a massive thing that it was like, they opened the stock exchange with my logo, and it was on the Tonight Show. My lettering was on the Tonight Show. It's like amazing to sit there and just be like, "How the hell did I get here?" You know, um, really kind of like mind blowing stuff. But it, I, I know it has nothing to do with my talent because I know my talent level is like on the bottom of the barrel compared to so many people who are just so you know, like naturally amazing designers and artists and like. I know I can owe this to just like working my ass off and just trying as hard as I can to just not keep it. Um, and, and in the meantime, it's it's been cool because I've been a part of more pro more product uh, projects where there was a lot more stuff that we could create. Like we, there's one thing I created that was called the, that's called the Standard Memorandum, and it's a notebook that it's kind of like. My, my wife's grandfather has this box of dull little bee plants that he's bought during World War One, And it was just this little notebook, and it has a couple little lines in it of, you know, what's what was happening that day, and, you know, if he owed somebody a couple bucks, or, you know, it even has stuff like his son was, was born, or his son got married. And it's just kind of amazing to see, like, this tiny little pocket notebook holds such, a, such an incredible priceless amount of, um, information. So I, I teamed up with a notebook company and I created, I recreated them. It was just something that I felt like I, I, the world needed. You know, like I saw it and I was just like, I want this. I want to be able to keep this. This is so, it's such a valuable thing to have. And like, what's better than, you know, going to your parents' house and they're kind of like going through stuff and here's a box of pictures from my school. Like, what's the first thing you do? You sit on the, sit on the floor and you're just like, holy shit, I'm going to go through all these. Like, that's kind of what I wanted to recreate with this. And it, it's, again, it's one of those things where it's like, if you want something, you just kind of have to create it yourself. Just go and just make it, find a way to make it happen. And you can see like, even every aspect of this design, it's just, it's so fun to design because you know how it's gonna be used. And, and it's great to actually recreate it and just, and put it to the world and turn it into something. Um, and that, that also gives me another project I've been involved with, and that's called The Hidden Seed. And now this is a wine company that I'm actually a partner in, which I never, I mean, I don't even drink alcohol, but I'm a partner of wine company, which is so nice. Um, but this, this kind of came about, like, I started designing it, and they, they had this great idea, and they, you know, they wanted to, you know, what can I do with it? How far can I push it? Where can I take it? So it's it's a it's a wine it's a wine that's uh, made in South Australia, and the vineyard in which it's made sits on top of a cave that a 26 million year old whale fossil is, is embedded in the ceiling of. It is just like this ridiculous story. So if like if you have a story that good, the label and the branding company cannot suck. It has to be cool. It's got to be interesting. And, and luckily for me, the, the primary owner is just like real rock and roll kind of dude. He's into like crazy strips and skeletons and this and that. And I even I even ended up producing uh, a commercial for it and all these like promo videos and everything. And it's there's no there's no pretension behind it. There's no um, there's there's nothing about it where 
falling into any cliches. All the music that we're using and stuff, it's just like, it's metal. It's like this doomy, gloomy stuff. And, it, you know, it, there's a lot of, like, skeletons and crazy crap. And, but the fact that they're willing to pay for the ability to do this, like, we have these wine glasses that you can see on the right side. They're matte black wine glasses. And it just, it's insane that I can make that suggestion. They're like, yeah, let's do it. That sounds cool. But that's, that's what happens, too. So if you get a client and you're able to work with someone that is willing to do whatever it takes to make their business awesome, you have the ability to really take all your skills and push them to like 150%. And, and it, the opportunity doesn't happen a lot, but when it does, you know you got to max it out. You know you got to do the most you can with it. Um, so that's kind of what I do with every single project I do every day. Um, I try to max out the cool factor as much as I can. I try to turn it into the best thing I can. Even in situations where, you know, sometimes you work with a corporate client and it'll turn into, you know, this department doesn't like this, and this department doesn't like this. You don't want to step on this one. So this, this art director is, you know, he's mad because you're doing this, blah, 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 whatever. What it comes down to, and I have to say this to clients, is that, like, they hire us because of what we can do. If they don't hire us to get in the middle of their drop, of their corporate drop and all that type of stuff. They hire us because they can't do it. And we're only there to help. And you know, some people are there with an agenda, but for the most part, a designer's job is to come in and to make the client look the best they can. And sometimes the clients need to be reminded of that. And sometimes when you do remind them of that, they, they loosen up a little bit on what you're doing and they allow you to take things where they should go. Um, and that's where you'll find that the best work comes out. So that's my little kind of a breach story. And uh, I'd love to um, take any questions if you guys have and uh, talk about some of this stuff. All right, guys, questions? Who's got one? Everyone's shy usually at the very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? You got one. Um, I'm curious. I got a question to start off. When you you picked that one thing that you got hired by, was it Pepsi or Coke that you figured was was that thing that was going to be the first thing that kind of established your style and your thing? How did that? Can you explain how that opened it up and you found something you didn't even know you you kind of maybe even had at that point? Well, it, it, that that style I had actually already been doing for a few clients, and it, I guess it kind of made its rounds a little bit. I I, had, I was in uh, like a computer arts magazine feature or something. Like I, I had already been building it up a little bit, but when that when that customer, when that client came to me and actually asked for it for an international campaign, yeah. and then I had to quote, I never quoted for anything more than maybe five or ten thousand dollars. Yeah, and then and that was like stuff that maybe didn't. Even when they asked me to quote for that, it was like, okay, this is a real deal thing. What I'm doing isn't just for t-shirts. This isn't just for, you know, people who own, you know, small little streetwear shops or sneakers stores or something. It was like, the company was interested in pursuing this and, and using it as the face of their brand. It was almost an acknowledgement in a way, man, like it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you know what's crazy is that, so when we did the ads, we also ended up developing this font. And Monotype, which is one of the largest font houses in the entire world, was going to develop it. And I remember being on a conference call with the creative director from Ogilvy, um, two font designers from Monotype, and one of the clients. And I'm sitting there, like, kind of scared shitless, but not letting on that I'm scared shitless. And, and they were just like, you know, John, what do you think? What do you think? You're the expert. And I'm like, yeah, I'm the expert. Put a full day. But the fact that I heard those people who are so advanced in their positions tell me that my opinion was worth something kind of like really established my, just kind of grounded myself in, in a little bit of the confidence that I didn't have before that. Got it. Cool. Questions? Yeah. So, like, what kind of. Uh, you have to speak up, but I, I, I can tell you. I can speak up in the message. Yeah. So, like, what is your inspiration for our hand lettering stuff? Like, who do you. Like. Inspiration for hand lettering. Where? What do you look at? What do you follow? Is or is you, you kind of taking it on on yourself? Well, the insp my my original inspiration for all hand lettering comes from um, 
like early 1980s movie posters and sports logos because that's you know that's the era that I grew up in and that's kind of what I used to emulate. So I used to being from New York, I used to draw the Yankees logo all the time and the Jets logo, and I used to draw the Ghostbusters logo all the time. <laughs> the Terminals. And and you if you look at that stuff, there was a lot of custom work in it. And that became a, a serious, serious obsession of mine. And then as I got a little bit older and I got into playing in bands and stuff, graffiti was a huge influence. Just like walking down the street and seeing all those crazy graffiti tags on the sides of walls, I loved it. And everything I became attracted to was custom lettering. And my mother and my grandmother were also really excellent calligraphy artists, so I learned how to do that too at a young age. And then by the time I kind of got a little bit older, I learned a little bit more about typography and, you know, kind of like your basic font styles, your, you know, your, your serifs, your sans serifs, all this kind of stuff. And as I started to get involved with it, each little thing started to piece itself together. Um, and every, every time you kind of discover a new thing, you almost discover the, the lettering that comes along with it. So even if you were to go to like like a like an American history museum, if you look at the folk art, if you look at like you know stuff from the Declaration of Independence, you know like all the scripts, the old English, all that type of stuff. At any point in any place in history, you're finding the written word decorated in a certain way. So in terms of my inspiration, it's it's kind of everything, you know. Like I go through my periods of like vintage this or modern that or whatever. Um, and of course, like one of the best places to look is old newspapers, late 1800s, early 1900s, because that's when things started really becoming graphic design, you know, for lack of a better term. But it was still all done by hand because they didn't have the ability to really mechanize that through consistent machinery, except for your, you know, your, your presses that would have, you know, your letter press or whatever it is. But even that would still be kind of um, awkward. But they would also have to carve those things anyway by hand. And the machine wasn't taking them. So everything you see was all by hand. So so every time I would see any type of lettering that was clearly through the process of a human being developing it, I just latched onto it and, and would go crazy um, trying to learn it and, and, and work it into what I do. Um, and eventually I would get sick of it and move to the next thing. And, so on and so on, that's just kind of goes. Yeah, good work. Uh, so I kind of want to know what's next for you since you've been so successful. What's your next big uh, thing? Like, do you want, is there like a company you would want to do something for? Maybe like Vogue or like uh, kind of like a fashion magazine or editorial or something like that? What would be next for you? Well, okay. I gotta, I gotta, what I would really love to do. Um, is take is take my take my business where it's at, turn it into a large scale branding firm. I would love to take what I do and blow it out times a thousand. I would love to become a business like Pentagon, where it's a branding firm. It's not necessarily a, uh, an advertising agency. It's a branding firm. It's all creative stuff out of the uh, you know with the clients that an ad agency would have, but without all the nonsense that comes along with it. So that's where I'd love to be. Hopefully in the next five, ten years it starts getting into that point. Hopefully by ten years at some kind of point, but you know, like it's like alright, it's a legit thing. Maybe um, in California. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, you need a California office. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have plenty of resumes ready. <laughs> cool. Anybody else? Go for it. Hi, I'm Clara. Um, I'm just wondering what's your, I see a lot of handwritten, a lot of texture that's sort of like, you know, it's all drawn by hand. How do you go from handwritten to digital? Like, what's your process there? Because that's, that's the biggest problem I'm having as a, as a traditional illustrator, moving to digital format and like losing that quality. You know, that's, that's a good question. Um, let me see if I can show you something. So, you see, that's it. <laughs> for, for <laughs> Forever, I have been, well, going back to maybe 2006, 2006 or so. Whenever I wanted to draw something, I always had like my mold skin or this or that or whatever kind of like holy grail notebook that I had. But for anyone that has, has a mold skin and isn't like the greatest artist in the world, 
you know that the worst thing in the world to do is draw a shitty picture on the first page. <laughs> so you can't draw on the first page, you're not really gonna start on the second page, and then it's like, how many empty moles can you have? <laughs> so, so between, um, my wife got me like this little notepad to just like, you know, scribble down notes on it for phone calls and stuff like that. And I found myself doing little doodles on it. So between that and just kind of like, out of necessity, printing, uh, pulling printer paper out with the printer and just drawing on it, I was able to understand that not everything has to be a masterpiece, not everything will be. So as soon as I felt the freedom to not be perfect in everything, I felt comfortable drawing in, in, in any place, any time, anywhere. So getting back to your question, everything I draw, or everything I've drawn up until a couple months ago, if I get to that, was on eight and a half by 11 printed paper. And it's just like, I have a bunch of these books, and I just fill them with all the drawings and stuff that I did for the project. So, which is great. So what I have here is like, you can see, you can see there's a nice book. Um, you can kind of see, so what you have here is like black and white outlines and stuff. Right? This is for a Nike belt that I said earlier this year. Do we have to take this guy right now? <laughs> <laughs> so, so what you have, so you got the black and white outlines, right? And with the black and white outlines, I found, for me personally, um, what they allow you to do is scan it into Photoshop, clean it up, get rid of some of the messy spots, adjust the levels, fix it however you want. You can go in and smooth out some of the lines, whatever. Um, and then you can get into Illustrator and you can trace it, which is great. Now, if you want to hold on to the line quality, one thing that I found was blowing up my drawings. So like if I scan in eight and a half by 11, I scan it in so it's like 20 feet by 30 feet, like crazy. Because it'll pick up all the little bleed marks on your pen. And then when you want to trace it in Illustrator, it's a piece of cake. Now, now what, what, so here's another, so there's a wrench thrown in the gears here too. So for Christmas last year, my wife got me an iPad Pro with an Apple Pencil, which is awesome, which is great, but style, I've never liked the stylus. I've never liked the Wacom tablets or whatever. I hate them. I just hate them so much. <laughs> and uh, Adobe came up with one too, and they actually let me test it. They had this. They sent me one, they let me test it. I was like, yeah, it's really cool, but it can't do this, it can't do that, it can't do that. And they were like, yeah, we know there are limitations. So I was like, cool, but it doesn't do shit for me. So, <laughs> so, so my wife got me this up with it. And I was like, oh, I love gadgets, this is gonna be so sweet. But she's like, you should, you know, you should use it. It would be really cool. And I got the pencil and everything. So for a couple months it sat there, and I didn't do anything with it. But my wife and my daughter, and this is great from back. It says, I love you, Daddy. Oh. <laughs> so, so all I had was just like never read thing about a guilt sitting on my desk. <laughs> like, oh, I'm not using this present that they got me that says I love you, Daddy on. So I was like, let me try. So I started messing around with it and little things like for me, my palm is consistently dragging on the paper. Yeah. Okay. So all the other styluses don't work with me. Because every time the stylus hits the thing and then my palm hits it. He gets confused and it doesn't know where to go. Okay. But the Apple, the Apple Pencil and the iPad Pro don't do that. They have palm rejection and it's really good palm rejection. So what it does is, if if you want to draw on it, you can you can connect it. You can use it almost like a, like one of those you know a Cintiq or something and connect it to Photoshop and draw in Photoshop. Okay. Or you can use I'll show you guys something else. You can use um, this app called Procreate, which has insane brushes. Um, and when you draw with it, it's, it's pretty amazing how good it works. Um, and you can see, this is something I'm doing, so I have a new t-shirt line that's coming out in a couple of days. <laughs> uh, I was signing the gift cards. So I did it on here, and you can't tell that this isn't an ink piece. Wow. So if you can see the details of oh, like, it really oh, looks like yeah. ink piece. You know, and I'll show you guys one other thing too. Um, let's see. So this was this was part of like um, this is a this is like a, a 
a fire and does like these cookbooks and stuff. But he's, this is what the pencils look like on the same oh, thing. That's so cool. It's like it's it's like really legit. So this is this is what happened with this thing. As soon as I like learned how to do it, um, well, actually, one of the things that happened. So let me show you guys real quick. So um, I had to design this. <laughs> happy with my question now. <laughs> I have this. <laughs> oh, wow. So this is huge. Oh, oh, right. Gorgeous. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> See how big it is? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, when I do anything that's a bigger package, the way I always used to do it was I would, I would map out the template, because they all have templates, map out the template, print it out on like six sheets of paper, Take them all together, draw it all, and then take all the pieces of paper apart, scan them in separately, and then and then um, you know stitch them together in Photoshop like a giant panoramic type of thing. Yeah. And that always leads to like weird hiccups in certain areas because it never scans straight. So I thought this is the perfect time for me to try out the iPad and see if this is literally worth everything that it seems like it is. So what ended up happening was I got the template and imported it. Oh. And I just started doing my sketches in it. That is so cool. Okay. So now another good thing is when when you draw an eight and a half by eleven, there's a lot of this. Yeah. You know? yeah. But not on the iPad because you just. Oh, that is so true. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> so, so not only do you get the ability to pinch and zoom, but it saves you from squinting. And as you can see, <laughs> already. Pretty um. So now what I've been doing, and it. it it kills me. It kills me with the with the feet of a thousand daggers in my heart. <laughs> is that I draw everything on this iPad and I haven't touched paper in like four months. Oh yeah. Because, because another thing that it does is it takes yeah. it takes the ink and instead of instead of black on white paper, it goes black on print paper. Uh -huh. And it exports as a Photoshop file. Yeah. So when you have that, it eliminates like an hour's worth of work. Yeah. That so so now I've been, I can. So what I do is I set up a template that mimics paper the same resolution that I've scanned it in as. I have that now, except I have about an hour's worth of work that I don't have to do. So that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at in terms of the process. And it's all this stupid thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's crazy. Thank um, you very much. I, I I've, I've heard nothing but great things about that that pencil and how it works on the iPad. So uh, it's a. That's incredible. What a cool little transition there. Anybody I'm else? I was like, I'm like so hands on about everything, and when I got yeah. this, it learns how to use it. Yeah. It, it, like, I wake up like in cold, with cold sweats in the middle of the night, somehow using paper. <laughs> 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 but look at the results. Like you said, it's wow. shaving time off, and you're getting better, if not, you know, much better kind of results. Yeah. And everything, yeah. and all the same technique, and all the same texture, and everything you've always wanted. It also, I'm also like of the mind that the first mark you put on the page is, is the right mark. Mm -hmm. Even if it's a mistake, it still feels the most emotionally connected. Yeah. But even with that, like even when you do that and you import it into Photoshop, it's still a lot of times where you you're just like, oh, now that it's all together, I'm sure I want to clean this up. I'm sure it's done differently. Yeah. It's still be so easy to just erase and keep the tone, and, like the aesthetics. Stays the same without just smoking it, you know. Yeah. So, kind of hard to say no to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Um, uh, uh, this is just kind of like discussion question, but um, have you seen the new Microsoft Surface Pro? Um, yes, I have. The studio, I tried studio. It. Oh, the studio. The uh, studio one. Yeah, I, ha I haven't tried it yet. I've seen it. I haven't tried it yet, and I'm like, I don't know. I'm like a little hesitant to try it. My my main issue with that is. Number one is that the Apple Pencil and the iPad have been working great, and I like finally developed a workflow. Yeah. Number two is Microsoft, and <laughs> I still how many years? Because like, it's like Microsoft, though it's terrible. But like, how many years of Apple shit have I learned? <laughs> oh, yeah. I need to switch over now. I'm gonna have to retrofit the entire studio with yeah. Microsoft stuff there. Yeah. But if it's good enough, and it actually, the only they haven't had such a great success rate, I think, with like. They're, they've got some really great ideas, and I actually did. Um, I did a, a, a judge the design competition in Dallas a few years back, and one of the girls that was there with us 
worked with an agency who was a Microsoft agency of record, and she had a Windows phone. And, and it was really, it was really, really cool. So everyone else had iPhones, and we we're just like gathering around our like, whoa, what is this? These boxes are crazy. <laughs> so the, the stuff that they've been coming up with has been amazing, but I haven't seen many actual creatives latch onto it. And it's stuff like when everyone's going in one direction, and all the files are a specific format, and everyone's used to using things the same way, and then to have to switch back again, it's just like, it almost makes me a little too nervous. Yeah. It's too nervous that I might love it too. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> more Anybody time else? more time spending learning another program. Yeah, right, right, right. Who's got time for that? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? One more? Everybody got any questions? All good? Are you on uh, you have your own personal like uh, Instagram or like social media way that we can follow you or like see your work? Yes, just go to um just John Cantino at Cantino on everything that you can imagine. Uh, it's just J O N John, um, and you'll find me. I mean, if you want, you can just Google me, and I'm sure that shit will pop up anyway. Um, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Anybody else? Good. All right, I think we're set, man. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks again, man. All right, talk to you soon.